Good morning, church. Great to be with you again in this way. And we're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do um, in our time together through online, online communication this way. So what I want to do today is preach a message that is bursting out of me. I've been really sitting on this for a while now, and it's amazing how God's timing is perfect. And what I have to share with you today will require you to put on your seatbelts, because this is going to be a wild ride. I just thought I'd warn you. Because what we're about to step into can truly change the way you live during this interesting season that we all find ourselves in. But to get us started, I want you thinking about a gift that you've received. I want you thinking about the gift that it may be in the form of a toy that usually you find in a show bag. We've all been to the Royal Melbourne show over the years, and particularly as you're a child, you can't wait for the show bags. I mean, I couldn't care less about the rides. Just get me to the show bag pavilion so I can spend mum and dad's money and then come home with a show bag full of garbage. <laughs> From a parent's perspective, it's garbage, but to a child, it's an absolute treasure trove. But try and think and try and remember on the toys that are found in these show bags. They're cheap, they're nasty. And many times they don't even work how they're intended to work the moment you pull them out of the bag. And there's a reason for that. The way they're made with the intention of how they're made is not to last. It, it, it might only last a few minutes and then it goes into the rubbish or goes into the back of a cupboard somewhere until next year you go back again and spend big time once again. But there's another, there's another reason why something doesn't work. And it's not to do with the actual product itself, it's the user that doesn't know how to use it properly. My wife tells me off all the time when I get into the kitchen and I pull out one of these whiz-bang Tupperware products and I get so frustrated and so angry because I can't work out how this stupid thing is meant to work and then she steps in, does something, and all of a sudden it works beautifully. And that's just so typical of us blokes. You know, we, we take something that... We don't understand. I usually find that and the older generation is like that with iPads and iPhones. <laughs> you know, they, they try to work out how this thing works and, and they get frustrated and they get angry and you know, throw it to the ground. There's something wrong with this stupid thing when the reality is the product's actually absolute perfection because it's made by Apple. That's for you, Andrew. And also, there's nothing wrong with the product. It's the user that doesn't quite know how to use it correctly. And, you know, I started thinking about that, and our faith can be seen in that way too. I'm sure you'd all agree with me that faith, when anchored in the truth of who God is and attached to his amazing promises, never fails. But when it doesn't work as we'd expect it to work, where does the problem really lie? Is the lack on God's end or is it on our end? I'm sure you too have been confronted in the past where your expression of faith didn't quite turn out as you would have hoped. You know, like you've, you've prayed for someone's healing and you, you had the faith in the moment to see them healed and set free from the condition that they were in, but there's no change. It, what about when you believed for a good result and you prayed in faith to believe that God would come through for you in a certain way and then whack, you got the opposite of what you expected. That tends to happen with us sometimes where we pursue a miracle, pursue a particular outcome, and instead of getting what we hoped, we get something different or nothing at all. There seems to be a mystery attached to the life of faith, and it's important for us to understand how this works. My faith, your faith, when it doesn't work in the given situation how we'd have hoped, I believe we then have an obligation to set aside time to ask God why. To approach it as a student, to approach it as a child and ask the Father, why God didn't my faith work in this moment? What God can I learn through this? Because I'm convinced, God, that the lack is not on your end, it's on my end. So God, if my faith is not working in a particular situation, I am obligated to ask him some serious and definite questions. So God has been speaking to me in the midst of all of this, this, these things that we're all facing as a people. It's a crazy world right now. But specifically, I've been talking to God about what does our faith look like in the midst of sickness, panic, fear, worry, anxiety 
that's growing around us day by day. But what does our faith look like in the midst of this dark season? When we're faced with physical symptoms, when we're faced with our jobs on the line and sometimes even job loss, when, when we're faced with empty shelves at a supermarket, what does your faith look like in a time like this? Come on, it's, it's okay for us to be very real here. At the moment, humanity and life feels very, very broken. Our faith is being tested. Or could it be that our faith is actually getting an opportunity to be activated? Ephesians 6 verse 12, Paul explains to us that there is more going on here than meets the eye. Look at the scripture that I've got here for you. It's from the Passion Translation. He says, Your hand-to-hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. You see, what we have going on, even now, around us, in the spiritual, is far more greater than what's occurring in the physical. But what I didn't show you are the two verses preceding that verse 12, because it's important to get there first before we understand the reality of what's happening around us. So look at verses 10 and 11 in Ephesians chapter 6. Paul writes, Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in you and through you. You see, we're being reminded here that though there is demonic activity going on around us, even as I speak right now, and yes, it's real, and yes, it's happening, and yes, the enemy has a very clear agenda to wreak havoc on humanity. But what I want to talk to you today about is this. We have authority over a defeated foe because Jesus has already defeated him. That's what Paul is writing to the Ephesian church. He's stating the fact that there are principalities, there are demonic realms that are operating and functioning, but we have the power of God through the Holy Spirit in us and through us, and that gives us a level of authority even over the demonic realm. You see, when we became Christians, we all inherited the name of Jesus Christ. And what that actually means, not only do we have salvation now through Christ, but we also have a level of authority because of the name that we represent. So we can come up against any plan of the enemy, any attack of Satan, and know full well that the name of Jesus is far greater and more powerful than Satan ever could be. But this key truth that I've just said right then, Satan works overtime to cause you and I to forget about it, to ignore it, and possibly even not to believe it. The enemy wants to continue defeating humanity with his lies and with his rubbish. He doesn't want anyone standing up against him and his attacks. I feel right now I need to unpack what it means for you and I to walk in authority so that we may be awakened to the glorious truth that Jesus has saved us into. It's been said that the value of our authority rests on the power that is behind that authority. That's a powerful quote. So the spiritual authority that you and I carry, that we carry against the devil, that we can rise up above every demonic principality on earth, this authority is from God himself. It is actually called authority is delegated power. Authority is delegated power. To help us understand what this looks like in the, in the realm of the physical that we're so familiar with, I want you to look at this image here. It's a policeman raising his hands, using the little cute red baton that he has, but the tremendous power that he carries is able to stop trucks and direct moving cars. Now, in and of himself, this policeman could not do any of that, but he is using the authority invested to him, which is delegated authority, which then gives him great power to stop a huge moving object. 
Now, he can't use his own strength. He can't use his own name to try and do that. I mean, imagine me in my civilian clothing going in the middle of traffic right now in a busy intersection in the city and me trying to stop traffic. I mean, people will think I'm absolutely bonkers. But it's the uniform that he or she puts on that gives them such tremendous authority which has been delegated to them by the government that we then pay attention to and that we respect. And that's what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 6.10. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord. Clothe yourself in the Lord. And therefore, there is an element of strength, a, a reality of strength, I should say, that overcomes you simply because you are now in the Lord. That means, get this, this is amazing, that means that you can step out in front of the devil, you can hold up your hand, and you can tell him not to come any closer. It is using the authority that you've been given to change the situation. Family, that's what you have access to right now. That's good news. That even in the midst of the chaos and the mess that we all find ourselves in, you have authority given to you by Jesus to stand, lift up your hand, and declare, no further, no more. That's a huge revelation for many Christians, I believe. Now, this amazes me that over the years, I've been digging into this and asking God what it tangibly looks like in my life, in the life of our church family. And you know what? As I dig into it more and more, I still get amazed by what Jesus has given us access to. It, it amazes me how much he would entrust to us, you and I, to carry the power of his name and the authority of his name in the world in which we live. Now, I'll address a little bit further on what this looks like for us in this season, but I, I need to just build on the truth that I've already established. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, Jesus is sending off his disciples into the world to carry on the mission that he had begun. Look at this in, in Matthew 28. He says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore go. The verse does continue, but I just want to stop it there. Therefore, because I have the authority, I am now giving it to you, therefore go and change the world. Go and make disciples. Go and preach the gospel of the kingdom, raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. So Jesus is stating here that what he has, he is now imparting, trusting and delegating to his followers from that point on. The disciples started it, and now you and I also have it. Jesus is saying this, this is who I am. This is what I have, and I'm giving it to you to represent me to the world that I'm sending you in. Show them what I am like. Show the world what I am like. I believe Jesus is saying that over us today. This is what delegated authority looks like. So the question we need to then ask is this. Listen carefully. Is there anything greater than the power and the authority of Jesus' name? Is there anything greater than the power and the authority of Jesus' name? Be honest in your answer. You see, you initially might say, well, of course not. The name of Jesus is all-powerful. The name of Jesus is almighty. But you know, when you and I get the opportunity to actually live the truth of that, sometimes the answer is quite different. <laughs> I don't say that to have any guilt or shame or condemnation on anybody. No way. It's important for us to realize where the lack is so that we can press in for a greater anointing. Now, this is not something that we learn with our intellect. Because in times like this, the intellectual knowledge it takes to understand this on a, on a theoretical perspective makes no difference at all. This must be received by revelation from God himself, which then awakens your authority in Christ Jesus. Think about it this way. If the church of Jesus Christ is his body, as the word describes, what does that mean? What difference can that possibly make in this coronavirus epidemic spreading across the globe? If the church is the body of Christ who has his name, who has been given his authority and power, are you starting to get what I'm at? 
this should change everything. Until then, until we realize this by divine revelation, we will be limited in our capacity to make any difference. Something that Jesus said in the Gospel of John always confronts me, always challenges me, because it helps me to understand, firstly, what I've been given, but secondly, how come I don't see the reality of that in every situation I face? Look, look at this verse. I absolutely love this. It's John 14, 12 to 14. Jesus said this, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, Jesus said, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Are you as messed up by that verse as I am? Particularly verse 12. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. <laughs> oh, man. Now we can read that and think, oh, that's nice, Jesus. But that's for the evangelists who need it. That's for the healers. That's for the pastors. That's for the prophets and the apostles. No, but that surely can't be for me. I'm sorry, but the only condition Jesus made in that, those verses is this. It's for those that believe. It's for those that believe in me, Jesus said. And I think that includes many of you. So what are these greater works that Jesus is talking about? Well, let's start with the works that Jesus did first, and then we can think about the greater works later on. I mean, that, I think that's fair to say. But this sounds so radical to many Christians because what we've done, we've put Jesus' works, his miracles, his signs and his wonders in a category that doesn't include us. We then can stand at a distance, be highly impressed by what Jesus has done through the Gospels, and we marvel at his supernatural abilities. But what happens when Jesus now turns to you and says, tag, you're it? How do you come to terms with verses like John 20, 21, where Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Don't put it in categories. Don't start saying, yeah, but it only relates to this, but not to that. I mean, says who? You can't escape the will of God in imparting to you his name, his power, and his authority. You can't escape it. But the problem is that the average Christian has more faith in Satan's authority and power than in God's. What have we put up with? that when seeing it from this perspective, we realize that we don't have to. So the foundation is pretty, pretty solid. Jesus has made it clear, not only to his first disciples, but to every follower that would follow them, that we carry the name. It is part of the inheritance with which we've been saved into. And the power and authority of that name, there is nothing on earth that is greater. Nothing. Nothing. So as the Holy Spirit's been stirring in my heart in the past couple of weeks in relation to this, I'm asking him, okay, God, what does this mean for us, the people of God in this season where there's so much fear, where there's so much panic and anxiety? What does it look like? What, what kind of power and authority do we possibly even have over the coronavirus? How should Christians respond to this? Should we crawl up in our little cave Hold our breath until it all goes away. Should we partner with fear? Should we, should we simply believe all the reports that are being spoken of over the media? How should you and I react to this? One thing that's becoming clear to me is that we can't rely on old patterns of prayer, old methods, old strategies, because this is a new season. None of us have ever faced anything like this before. So it's important for you and I to ask God, God, what are you saying to us in this moment? What is the word that needs to come from our mouths in this moment? What does power and authority look like in this dark season? I heard someone say this past week, a leader from another church, and he said, the level of my prayer life that sustained me back then no longer does. God is calling me higher. You can't rely on yesterday's manner. 
Isn't it interesting how God gave us Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 at the start of this year, knowing full well what you and I would be facing? That the old things have gone and he's doing a new thing. That what you relied on yesterday, what you relied on a month ago, you can't rely on that anymore. You see, God is inviting you in to hear the now word that he has for his church. Kenneth E. Hagan, in his awesome book, The Believer's Authority, gave us this powerful thought. Listen, listen to these words. He said, we are the body of Christ. Even though we have prayed, now, Lord, you do this and that, leaving everything up to him, he has conferred his authority on the entire body of Christ, the church. Thus, he goes on to write, many problems exist because we permit them to. We're not doing anything about them, he writes. It's quite confronting. Another Bible study won't do it. Another deep theological discussion about what's going on will not do it. Spending hours listening to the latest conspiracy theory, watching the latest YouTube clip won't change anything. It'll mess you up. It won't change anything. It'll mess you up on the inside, but will change nothing on the outside. Only when God's people, you and I, rise up and be awakened to our authority and we actually take charge of what Jesus has given permission to us to take charge of, and we start speaking, and we start declaring, and we start praying from that place, you watch things change. You watch the influence of the enemy shift, the atmosphere that he's trying to wreak havoc on in our world today. You watch it shift. Dear ones, are you convinced of this? Are you convinced that I'm talking about you? I'm not talking about someone else. I'm talking about you. I've met too many intellectual Christians to last me a lifetime. They are discussing and they are debating about what is going on and how this fits into these obscure scriptures and prophecies. Please, I encourage every single one listening. Check what God is saying now. Don't get second-hand information. Go to him personally. He's inviting you in. He's wanting to show you who you are because of who he is. He's wanting you to understand that the name which you represent is the name that can shake this virus to its core and stop it in its tracks. Could this be the church's finest hour when this sleeping giant called the church wakes up and shakes the earth with the truth of Jesus' name. Could this be the hour that we have been prepared for? Could it be that God is waiting for his church, the sons and daughters who carry his glorious name, to stand at the highest points of our town and declare healing, declare freedom, declare this thing come to an end in the name of Jesus. What would happen if you said in total faith, because of who you are in Christ, coronavirus, die in the name of Jesus. You will not come to my family. You will not touch my town. And you know, if it does, and for some reason you do start getting symptoms and you do get infected by this, hey, take a stand against it and pronounce healing in the name of Jesus. You see, his name and the authority and power attached to his name is good for every season. Don't let guilt and shame come upon you should you feel a bit sick and should you be confined to your room for two weeks. No, let's take a stand against whatever is facing us in the moment. Now, I'm so deeply moved by this as I'm listening to what God is saying on a daily basis because I'm being confronted by what do I really believe? Times like this tend to do that to us. Do you really believe what God's word says about you? Do you really believe it? Yes, I want the end of all of this to happen sooner than later. But are we praying like we are convinced? Or are we praying, not out of authority, but just hoping that our luck will change? Kenneth E. Hagen goes on to say in his book, I've got the quote on the screen here for you. He says, as long as Satan can keep you in unbelief or hold you in the arena of reason, he'll whip you in every battle. 
But if you'll hold him in the arena of faith and the spirit, you'll whip him every time. He won't argue with you about the name of Jesus. He's afraid of that name. Oh, isn't that good for your heart? He won't argue with you about the name of Jesus because he is afraid of that name. (laughs) Come on, church. Come on, church. We are here for a reason. Become demanding. Become bold. Become the person of faith that you are saved to be. The great man of faith who's highly respected by many now is Smith Wigglesworth. This is a quote that, get ready to rock, get rocked. Here we go. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what I believe. (laughs) Isn't that convicting? Let's stand up against the attacks on humanity. Stand up against the attack on your life and on your family. And I mean you, dear one. I mean the youngest to the oldest, every single one of us who believe in the name, who follow Christ, who have been adopted into his glorious family. Every single one of us have got this as a part of our inheritance. Equip yourself and empower yourself in this season. Speak to God about this. Allow him to speak to you about this. Read the word of God. Let it soak into your spirit. Let it, let it change who you are. Let it transform you. Let it bring life to your being and to your words. Read other books that are available. A book that I've already mentioned in this message is this book here, The Believer's Authority by Kenneth E. Hagan. He's passed away now, but this book is such an easy read, but it is a powerful, powerful read that can transform your life. It can take you up a whole new level in your authority. I encourage you to do that. But in closing, I can't shake this, dear church. We can't sit and wait, sit and wait. What if, what if breaking this pandemic off humanity can actually be impacted by the words coming out of your mouth? What if your prayers shake the demonic kingdom to its core? What if this virus bows the knee to the name of Jesus coming out of your mouth? Are your prayers that powerful? Yes. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the details about what this is going to look like, but I do have faith in the one who has sent us into this world to represent him, to carry the name above every other name. Now, we either believe it or we don't. You either believe what he said in his word or you don't. I encourage you to take this seriously. I encourage you to make an intentional decision to ask God about this, to be open to the revelation he wants to give you. And I can feel this stirring in my spirit so strongly over the past few days. I was a little bit hesitant in sharing this message today because of how it might be taken. But you know what? We have to understand who we are in this season. We have to let the Spirit breathe upon this identity of who we are in Christ. I just want to bring to your attention once again this quote by Smith Wigglesworth. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm moved only by what I believe. Let that be your daily declaration, dear family. So if anyone watching is hearing what I'm saying and and wants to live it to such a degree where it's beyond a a sermon that you listen to or in a book that you read, I invite you to open your heart to what Holy Spirit wants to do with you today. Firstly, if you don't even know Jesus, if you're not even following Jesus, all of what I said you don't have access to yet. You see, this is given to those Let's say yes to him in saving faith. Now, if you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart and into your life and you'd like to, just just in this moment, do it now. Just say, Jesus, I, I invite you into my life as the Lord of my life, as the one in which I submit my life to. I thank you for forgiving me of my sins and my my mistakes and my failures. And today I make a choice as best as I understand that Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to live above this. 
I don't want to live under the circumstances anymore, God. I want to live above them, carrying your name and your power and your authority. Just say, Jesus, here I am. I want you in my life. But to all of us, I just want to end in a prayer. So please join me right now where, you're at, where you are. Jesus, thank you for breaking the curse of sin upon our lives by your death on that cross. Thank you for for raising to life again, to show us that not even death can keep you away from us. But in this moment, Jesus, we are confronted with our faith. That is it a faith that works or is it a faith that is lacking and we need to press in to you to understand why. Holy Spirit, breathe upon us right now. Awaken us to understand the name that we carry the name that gives us the authority and the power and to understand why we are still here in this season. I pray for your church, my God, across the nations. I pray for your church, this glorious, powerful family to rise and start declaring in faith the name of Jesus over this virus, over our stock markets, over the finances of every nation, over every fear, over every panic, over every distress. We declare in the name of Jesus for it to come to an end. That the world will take notice that our God is powerful, that our God is the powerful God that we keep on singing about, that we keep on preaching about and declaring about. Our God is alive. Our God is here right now and he has something to say through us. Help us to rise up, Lord. In Jesus' name we live. In Jesus' name we breathe. And in Jesus' name our entire being, being exists. Send us out from this day on, God, with new eyes new ears, and a new level of faith. And I seal it now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with us, dear one. As you go out tomorrow, probably not going out, even, if, even as, as you're at home, understand this. You live from a different reality now. Glory to God. Bless you. We love you. We're praying for you. And let's see what God will do this week. Amen. Guys, thanks for just spending your morning with us and we'll see you guys next week. So, yep. yeah, have a wonderful week and be blessed. Bye. Bye. Love you.